Well, hello there. Most of the world's plant biomass is terrestrial, uh, coming in at 450 gigatons, as opposed to the ocean's plant biomass, which is just one gigaton coming from seaweed and algae. However, the ocean produces 50% of the world's oxygen, despite being two orders of magnitude less than their dry counterparts. Welcome back to our Marine Biologist Plays Submorsica Below Zero. In this video, we are going to be learning about the pelagic zone. Uh, this spans all the way around the ocean while we search for Alan's body parts and scanner walls. So watch all the way to the end of the video to see everything that I talk about. We cover in a few topics. However, I have put chapters if you wish to skip ahead. I upload new videos every Friday, so subscribe not to miss out on that sweet ocean knowledge from my Marine Biologist Place of Nautica series. We are here at Omega Station, scanning bits and bobs. I challenged your spy pengling to a foot race earlier. Because you got tired of losing to me? Ouch. <laughs> what if I've been letting you win so I can see you smile? Cute, but I don't believe it. There are easier ways to make someone smile. Easier than losing a foot race? Oh, I think you're a woman with many talents. What are you implying? The artwork that appeared in my lab the other day. Oh, that. A study in Parhelion Red. I assume you had something to do with that. That depends. Do you like it? It's beautiful. Like the person who gave it to me. If I didn't know better, I'd say you were flirting with me. Do you know better? I... I don't know what I know anymore. Not when you're looking at me like that. Hey Sam, you want to say hi to my kids? I told them I'd show them a day in the life of a scientist. Of course. Hi Orin, hi Svea. Tell us what you're working on. Oh, um, this is a personal project. Looks more like biology than robotics. Yeah, I would... Investigation notes. Omega Lab was first breached by heavy impact, perhaps from a sea track modified with some sort of battery implement. A localized explosive charge was then released and detonated. We've studied the first corral bacteria samples from the specimen. Results are promising. We were able to stimulate rapid multiplication of cells in a controlled environment resulting in the creation of several different mutations with potentially useful applications. Think of the possibilities. Life-saving treatment, genetic research. It could be a window to understand the evolution of life on this planet. The findings could move us forward by years. We recommend a wider study, using samples collected from a greater variety of sites around the original postulate. We trust you will provide the necessary security to do so. The Leviathan site must be protected. Danny's not here, I'm afraid. That's okay. It's you I wanted to see. What's that you're working on? Just a sketch for a piece I want to make. <sighs> I'm slacking off. Don't tell the boss lady. <laughs> I won't. It's beautiful. What is it? I'm doing a series inspired by bacteria. Mutant beauty. Life, death, risk. You know, that kind of thing. What's this one? It looks like Harab. But, Vin, is this a mutation? It's just an art project. You know you're doing that thing with your neck, like when you're trying to bluff an alien intruder. So the Pelagic Ocean refers to the entire water column of the open ocean. It's the largest inhabitable zone on Earth and consisting of 99% of the inhabitable area. It's 1.37 billion cubic kilometers and spans around the entire planet. 
The pelagic zone is divided up into five depths. They're epipelagic, mesopelagic, parthipelagic, abyssopelagic, and adopelagic. We'll start with the epipelagic. As light easily penetrates this zone, it's often teeming with life. Many of you might think of the iconic marines like sharks, dolphins, rays, and whales. But often the backbones are phytoplankton that photosynthesize, and zooplankton like copepods are our primary consumers. These two groups will make up the largest abundances of an epipelagic ecosystem by far. Plankton are defined as an organism that cannot swim against the current in a, in a horizontal manner. An organism that can swim against the current is called the necton. Interestingly, phytoplankton and zooplankton have buoyancy mechanisms that allow them to rise and lower in the water column during the day and during the night, such that during the day they catch more sunlight and during the night they avoid predators. Also, much of the pelagic ocean is oligotrophic. In other words, there's very little dissolved nutrients in the water. The building blocks of life so to speak. In some areas of the Pelagic Ocean, like New Caledonia, there are high concentrations of diazotrophic organisms. These creatures have the ability to pull diatomic nitrogen from the atmosphere and convert it to ammonia, which feeds them into the nitrogen cycle and eventually becoming nitrate, which is used to build amino acids, which in turn is used to build protein, which are the building blocks of life. Sort of Various creatures get eaten and so the protein eventually makes its way up the food web to something like a swole dolphin, for example. Remember, if you're enjoying this video, leave a like, subscribe, comment fish. It helps me know what you guys are enjoying and uh, so to make more content. Okay, once we've escaped this cave, we'll head towards object PK-8. Okay, so as we approach uh, PK-8, we learn about primary producers of the pelagic uh, and now we shall learn about consumers. So at the beginning of the video I said there was about one gigaton of marine plant life. Now usually uh, the primary producers have the largest biomass of a food web and it forms kind of like a pyramid, a trophic pyramid. However, the one gigaton of marine plants supports a whopping five gigatons of marine animals. This is because of a higher turnover of plant biomass and a lower turnover of animal biomass, meaning that the abundance of the plant stays relatively stable while uh, the animals, one, reproduce less and two, they feed on each other. And so they're not all just eating the plants. So the first predator of the food web, also known as a primary consumer, in this instance is zooplankton. This is a group that covers a few different organisms that eat algae or other zooplanktons. Uh, zooplankton are quite often very small, or, or otherwise known as microzooplankton. They're not visible to the naked eye, or barely visible to the naked eye. Organisms such as copepods, amphipods, ostracods, arthropods, and rotifers, mycids, and krill all constitute many species of small fish like herring, anchovies, sardines, and caitlin, for example, will feed on microzooplankton by swimming with their mouths open and filtering out prey with their gill rakers. These small fish are keystone species for both keeping phytoplankton and zooplankton abundance in check and also providing prey for the iconic large predators that we know, like marlin, yellowfin tuna, and barracuda. The pelagic is also home to other species like dolphins that can echolocate, whales that can eat over a million calories in one mouthful, and the sargassum fish which lives in floating clumps of seaweed in pelagic subtropical waters. After that, we will head towards artifact X3J, and that will be the last one on our trip. The mesopelagic is 200 to 1000 meters, and only about 1% of the sun's light reaches this area. This is because of light attenuation, whereby light waves collide with the water molecules. Longer wavelengths. This is because of light attenuation, whereby light waves collide with water molecules. Longer wavelengths are absorbed first, and then shorter wavelengths 
Eventually, all the light is absorbed along by the bathypelagic zone, which is pitch black. The mesopelagic is inhabited by a myriad of organisms well adapted to low light environments. Fish such as lanternfish, saber toothed fish, lancet fish, hatchet fish, bristle mouths, and stop light loose jaws inhabit this zone. More than 90% of mesopelagic fish are bristle tooths and lantern fish. As there's no plant life at this depth, all the fish are predators of some kind. Prey species like zooplankton make their way down from the epipelagic to form the base of the trophic web, food web. The inhabitants of the mesopelagic are characterised by one trait exclusive to the deep sea for marines, bioluminescence or photophores. An organism's, which is an organism's ability to produce light with its body. They do this with a special molecule called luciferin, which is catalyzed by luciferase to an unstable state. Basically, electrons orbit an atom's nucleus in shells, and these shells are stacked on top of one another. When an electron jumps up a shell, it becomes unstable, then it will jump back down and release some light as it does this, and that's how these organisms produce light. Photophores can be used defensively by prey species to confuse predators with flashing lights. One shrimp species misleads its predators with a bioluminescent package that it expels and then flashes as it swims away in the dark. Hatchet fish, for example, that live further up in a water column have bioluminescence on their underside, on their belly, um, and this breaks up their shadow as there's still a little bit of light where they are they have a shadow and the photophores break up the shadow so there's less likely to be seen by predators above. Predators like the anglerfish also use bioluminescence as a lure, prey and they're attracted to them, their lights like moths towards a light in the dark. Some fish have photophores under their eyes and they use them like the headlight, like a car. cope with the loss of memories like forgetting someone's birthday i don't know it just happens when you die some quantity of knowledge is lost forever to the next generation isn't that I'm warning you if you call humanity inefficient one more time i will swim us both into the mouth of a leviathan is that sarcasm i am still having trouble differentiating how inefficient efficiency aside all right, just before I wrap up the video, I want to give a quick second guide around my base as I visited nearly all the old terror sites now and put in quite a few upgrades. Uh, I think like most of the blueprints come from the old terror sites, so there isn't really much else to discover. I've uh, got more plants down here. Uh, it's good to cultivate these because you never know when you'll need them. We've got the prawn suit in the moon pool. So the glass dome and some windows looking very nice. Storage as usual. So I've got my fabricator, speaker for the sound system. All of my storage is labelled up. I've been using state symbols, for example. SiO4, silicon 4 oxygens for quartz, carbon for diamonds, Cu for copper. We have the recycler from here, I haven't recycled anything yet but that'll be good. I've got a nuclear reactor with four active rods in it, power cell charger, battery chargers, Bioreactor. I've got some plant pots here, each with a different one in, well, except for that one, that one's the same. Uh, three aquariums for fish, can eat these, can put them in the bioreactor. Look, 500 out of 500, and there's only two fish in there. So go on. Put that in there. Got some plant beds there, Chinese potato, frost vase, lantern tree. This aquarium, this alien containment, if you build it in one of these um, big rooms, 
It's good oval shape, takes up half the room. I'm just using that for housing fish to eat or just like overcatch. Got a fevered pepper tree, more Chinese risotto plant. I'll put some more plant beds around there. Got two water filtration machines, super handy. They give you water and salt. So this alien containment, this is actually for eggs only. Okay, I did put a fish in there, a new fish. Uh, I've got some eggs cooking at the moment. They do take about three in-game days to hatch. I've made it three high, you can stack these on one another. This is my habitation room, I'm saving this for the toilet and the shower and that. I've got a window, some posters that you can barely see. These aquariums are just for looks. Bed for sleeping, trash bin, there's no need to use that really. Ooh. Got our music. Turn that down. The executive toy for fun. Now I haven't put anything in this tower yet. However, I will put things in there, but it's mostly actually um, for access to the surface. So we go up here, we go through here. Here I've built my snow fox pad. We'll wrap it up there. Thank you so much for watching. Remember to like and, and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. Remember to comment fish if you found it interesting. I'll be releasing my next video next Friday, so keep your eyes peeled for that. See you in the next video. Have a good one.